Okay, thank you guys uh, for coming. I'm Joe Ament. I'm a recent PhD candidate uh, at the University of Vermont in the Economics for the Anthropocene program. Uh, I'm actually presenting today a sort of what's a, a, a research agenda around an emerging ecological macroeconomics. But in order to do that, I want to just give a little bit of, of background on some of the assumptions built into the neoclassical school and then where ecological economics differs and how that sort of drives this research agenda. So economics is classically defined as the allocation of scarce resources among competing alternative desirable ends. That's a good definition. That's what you'll see in any Econ 101 textbook. Uh, the problem is, what does allocation mean, right? Uh, we say the allocation of scarce resources, but what do we mean by allocation? What does scarcity mean? Uh, this is really important. Scarce to whom? Scarce relative to what? Uh, I actually like to think of, instead of scarce, available resources, right? So if we change our thought thinking process from scarce resources to resources that are available to us, it changes this definition of economics. And lastly, um, this desirability, is that positive or normative? The neoclassical school claims a lot of uh, positivity in their work, whereas the ecological economic school is very clear that we have normative assumptions. Uh, one, one, piece, one thing that I think is really inf important here is information is this non-scarce resource, right? If I use information, it doesn't leave any less information for any of you to consume. And information is also one of those resources that tends to get better with more use, right? Uh, the more we use information and share it, the better that information becomes. Uh, and we have an information economy today, largely. So having an information economy, uh, which is a non-scarce resource, sort of challenges this whole definition of what is economics, right? Um, I'll go through these real quickly. Uh, but the neoclassical assumptions are, you know, as as she just mentioned, the rational actor is self-interested with these insatiable wants. We can never get enough. Uh, it tends to be a positive social science, uh, largely based on mechanical physics and reversibility. Price and profit are these equilibrium enforcing negative feedback loops. Uh, as Josh likes to say, our, the human mind has thousands of feedback loops. And it's crazy that we think that the entire society and ecological system and uh, economic system can be um, maintained in equilibrium using just a price as the only feedback loop. Uh, and also, that there, it, it's based on these, this linearity with no emergent properties. Um, thresh, uh, it, it doesn't think about thresholds. Uh, and, and like I said, with the mechanical physics, uh, there's sort of this reversibility assumption built into it. Ecological economics, on the other hand, uh, says that humans are emotional, we're highly sociable, uh, we're satiable. You know, I, I, I had a huge breakfast and therefore I didn't really have that much at lunch just now. You know, I, I was full. Uh, a neoclassical economist would say, no, you want more. Um, we draw on a broad science, right? My, my work uh, on monetary theory draws from anthropology, geography. Um, we, we look at biology, ecology, evolution, and complexity theory very, uh, very much. Uh, price and profit, as we look at it, can be positive uh, feedback loops as well as negative feedback, loop, back, uh, feedback loops. When we look at the housing market, for example, in 2006, we saw price acting as a positive feedback loop instead of the negative feedback loop that it's supposed to, in theory. Uh, and contrasting the neoclassical assumptions, there's, we, we, we see thresholds, surprises, and these emergent properties, especially uh, in natural systems. Um, they say that if the Amazon is deforested to the 30%, that it will collapse, right? Whereas the neoclassical uh, linear school of approach to looking at things, if you got to 28, you could say, whoop, we messed up, and then back up and get back to 32% forest cover. Whereas we know that that won't happen, it'll completely collapse below 30. Um, so the goals of neoclassical economics are this the satisfaction of subjective preferences. Uh, we also like to say that it's these, these Preferences were weighted by purchasing power, uh, the maximiza maximization of our personal utility, and also efficiency. The goals for ecological economics, uh, well, I should actually say, these aren't necessarily put in order, any order. These are the three, three main goals, whereas ecological economics puts an order on their goals. The first is to set a sustainable and optimal scale for the size of the economy. Uh, we do that largely by looking at science. The second below that is we decide, once we've decided how big our economy can be, we say, how do we distribute those resources justly and equitably? Uh, we draw heavily on ethics for that. And then lastly, once we've done all that, then we can kind of say, okay, how are we gonna allocate 
these resources. Um, and we do that using sufficiency instead of efficiency. All right, so macroeconomics. This is the classic macroeconomic model. Uh, the GDP is the, uh, equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus uh, exports and imports. Uh, what we're starting to ask in ecological macroeconomics is, is this consumption sustainable? You know, in the neoclassical school, any consumption is great and it adds to GDP, which is awesome. We start to say, well, is that a sustainable consumption model? When we invest, how, are the, how is that investment allocated? Where, does it, where is it going? Is it investment in SUVs or is it investment in green energy, right? Uh, and how are we distributing that investment? We have a ton, a ton of investment now in our current economy that's being funneled to the to one tenth of one percent. Is that appropriate? What is the government spending on? Right. This is really important. What are those common pool resources that we're spending on? How are we maintaining our infrastructures uh, in a in a way that is sustainable? And this is I use a Mac, so it's a little bit uh, off here. But these exports and imports are we exporting and importing? Are we trading with our global partners in a way that is sustainable, uh, both socially and ecologically? So we, we're starting to ask these questions around the broad, uh, uh, the, the the classic ma macroeconomic model from uh, neoclassical economics. And instead of using GDP, we're starting to look at other indicators. Um, I'm sorry for this. Uh, this says non-growth investment. What, so again, what types of investment are we doing? And are we worried about simply return and growing the economy? We're starting to ask questions around progress and development. So is GDP amazing? Or are we looking at developing our people? Uh, and what does progress mean? Does it mean being wealthier? Or does it be, mean being uh, stewards of our uh, common inherited uh, ecosystems and society? And then we're also, as we've said, that macroeconomic model looks at scale and distribution, which aren't in these, uh, this GDP equation at all. All right, so now I'm going to get a little bit more into my own research. I look at monetary uh, theory uh, broadly. And what we're starting to look at in, in ecological macroeconomics is this, the modern money system, which 98% uh, of the money in circulation is created by private banks when they uh, lend loans, uh, create loans at interest to uh, enterprises, um, corporations, individuals. That money then circulates through the economy by way of commerce and is destroyed when it's paid back with interest to the bank. Um, a little bit of that is siphoned off to the public by way of taxes. Uh, and the treasury creates a little bit as well. The vast majority of this of the money in circulation today is, is a result of this system. And that undermines some of the goals that we talk about in ecological economics, right? Uh, Debt-based money always has to grow in order to pay off the interest rate. I'm going to get to that in a second. That's actually controversial. Um, but I largely believe that that is true. So that puts a heavy strain on ecosystems. So our money system is sort of right at the base of why we're having trouble achieving anything that we're talking about in our world uh, from a justice, pers uh, a sustainability perspective. Just distribution, uh, the, this money system creates a wealth transfer from borrowers and renters to lenders and landlords, right? So if we talk about income inequality and what is driving income inequality, the biggest thing that we th think is driving that is simply the way money is created and circulated in our economy. And then the sufficient allocation, uh, finance versus pr production. We're, we're putting a lot of money in finance and less money in production. Um, and we're looking at things from a consumptive uh, uh, standpoint as opposed to a sufficiency standpoint through this modern money system. An ecological economics money system would replace, uh, would create money by the way, public spender, uh, public sector spending for public needs. That money that would then be destroyed by taxes in order to maintain the value of the currency. And then what was left over uh, within to, in, to, in order to maintain that value could be lent out to the private sector for sustainability and justice and sufficiency um, goods. How am I doing on time, Sean? Five, all right. All right, so the research agenda that we're looking at, uh, this is broad. Um, but it largely falls under two, two areas. So the issues and solutions. So issues, we've got these technical things. What does the money creation process look like? We need to dive deeper into that uh, and really answer some big questions. What is the role of interest in the economy? Um, interest is really interesting. Sorry, pardon the fun. But um, in ecological economics, there's this, 
there's a rift between whether or not interest does create a growth imperative, and there, there's a, a school that says it does not, um, and then there's a school that says it absolutely does. So we need to really answer that, right? And how does ecological economics approach the role of interest? Interest is also interesting because a really high rate of interest um, is, uh, would be a really good idea from a stopping consumption standpoint, right? Uh, so you've kind of got this idea of a really high rate of interest um, slowing the economy, but it's also really good for sustainability. So it's got this, it, it does two things, and we need to figure out what we want from an interest rate and what the role of an interest rate is. We're also really interested in inflation. When the neoclassical school talks about printing too much money, that'll cause inflation in the economy. We don't really see that that's true when we look at the empirical facts. Um, but it's still a question that we need to answer. What is the role of money and inflation, how these things work together, and obviously energy. Um, these theoretical pieces around issues are taxes versus regulations. Um, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I don't want to take up too much time, but um, rent theory in the commons. So what is the role of individuals uh, in creating wealth versus what is the role of society in creating that wealth, and to whom should that wealth then be distributed? Um, this difference between investment and development that I sort of hit, hit on a little bit ago. Uh, and then from a solutions perspective, um, evolutionarily, and this is actually the, the key name of this conference, is this evolution versus revolution idea. Um, how are we using monetary and fiscal policy in an evolutionary way to approach some of our problems? Um, a lot of green thinkers are talking about sustainable investment and sustainable trade. Is that good enough? That's one of our big questions. These are these evolutionary solutions. Whereas revolutionary solutions would look at full reserve solutions uh, where banks weren't able to create money when they lent ideas of public money and national banks. Um, and then these local currencies that can exist within um, small uh, areas that are outside of the monopoly of current uh, hegemonic money. And then these things that sort of underline everything is these, these ontological ideas. What is money? That's the, uh, chap that's the name of the chapter, one of the chapters in my dissertation. We need to really answer that question. What is it? You know, how does it work? How does it function? What is its nature? Does it reflect the ontological assumptions of the economy within which it, it, it exists? Or does it differ from that? And how are, are all those new, uh, nuances uh, important? What is value? We, we've heard a lot of different discussions on value today in every one of the uh, talks I've been part of. Um, what is the value on a finite one? And how do we value things? Um, We've got limited wealth, but unlimited rulers. Um, what are our relationships with one another and our, what are our relationships with nature? These are big ontological questions that we need to ask in order to um, put forth an ecological macroeconomics. And we also need to think about, like I said, sufficiency versus efficiency uh, with respect to our consumption. One thing that's also really important is this dis distinction right here between evolution and revolution. Politics plays a really important part in that. And there's these questions I, I sort of tend to be on the revolutionary side. Let's, let's have these big revolutionary changes. But that's also really dangerous. If we just have a revolution, things could fall through the cracks and be really ugly, right? So where, how does politics play a role in moving from evolutionary ideas that move toward revolutionary ideas? Are some evolutionary ideas dead ends? Do we attack or uh, go after them and they fall apart and nothing really gets changed? Or can some of these evolutionary ideas transition into a revolution that, that we need to see? Um, oh, I forgot I had really cool animation there. Well, you guys are better off for not having seen that. Anyway, um, thank you so much. I want to thank my, my funding sponsor, E4A, um, the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics. Uh, actually, it's the environment now, I apologize, at the University of Vermont and the Rubenstein School at the University of Vermont. Thank you very much. And I'll also be happy to answer any questions later. Maybe there's time for one question, if there is a question, because I'll have to set up for a moment. Okay. <laughs> I had sort of turned off, but okay. <laughs> Any questions? Whoa. Have you looked at the international aspect at all? Uh, yeah. How various monetary units start to play a little bit with each other to exchange rate, and what that should be based on? Uh, um, yes, and yes, yes. It's really interesting, part of when I think of uh, exchange rates and international issues, um, oh, do I want to be in here for this? Yeah, I guess so. Um, 
So, so the, the one of the chapters that's called "What Is Money?" Is I take this really broad look at the history of money, and in doing that, yeah, I look at a lot of different monetary regimes, regimes, and how the U.S. dollar, for example, maintains its hegemony. Um, there, there's a lot of theory on, on why we transitioned after the war from the pound to the dollar, um, and looking at all of those all of that from an economics perspective, but actually more importantly, probably his, history, um, anthropology, and why a lot of these transitions happened. And I also look at, like when I think about speculation, I look at um, speculative uh, purchases of exchange rates and how a lot of these billionaires are able to use money to make money to make more money. Um, and a lot of that's being done by uh, leveraging their own, de le leveraging money in order to buy money, to gain money. It, it's just like a crazy messed up system. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.